اوكي مساء الخير عليكم جميعا اشكركم لانضمامكم معي انا سمر الدهمش جراح والكاتبه الامريكيه الفلسطينيه الغنيه عن التعريف سوزان ابو الهوى اليوم بدنا نحتفي باخونا وصديقنا والاستاذ والمعلم والملهم والاب والاخ والابن رفعت العرعير رفعت له تاثير هائل مش بس على قضية فلسطين لكن هو تمكن من أنه يدرب الكثير من الشباب والشبات على التحدث عن فلسطين سنبدأ الآن بفيلم عن رفعت لحين وصول باقي المشتركين وأنا وسوزان راح نتبادل التعامل مع الزوم اليوم نسمح لأكبر قدر من الناس من المشاركة تفضلي سوزان السلام يا سمار مساء الخير um, and uh, good afternoon to everybody we're going to do this in English and Arabic I see there's some questions about that um, we are here to remember our dear friend Rifat al writer, professor, friend, mentor uh, warrior, um, beautiful Palestinian human being. Uh, his, his absence is deeply felt and we are all uh, feeling a searing anguish at the murder uh, of our friend. So we Samar and I assembled this group of people who knew Rifat well, in particular his students. Um, we know he changed the lives of generations of Palestinians in Gaza. And we, uh, we want to honor that and we want to open this space mostly for his students and the people who loved him and knew him well. We're going to start with um, someone who needs no introduction. Ali Abu Nama is the uh, co-founder of Electronic Intifada. You all know him. They are also going to be doing, on Monday, they're going to be doing a uh, something uh, in memory of Rifat, and I'll, I'll hand it over to Ali to tell you more about that and to talk about Rifat. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Samar. Thank you for bringing us together so quickly. And uh, I, I'm just going to take a few minutes. Uh, I've been given the privilege to go first, not because I deserve to go first, but because uh, I have a time constraint that uh, means I can't stay for the whole session, but I will watch, uh, watch it later. Um, but I want to start by offering my sincere and heartfelt condolences to everyone who knew Rifat and who loved him, especially to his students. Um, we have all been coping with how do we live in a world where we're seeing our loved ones, our friends uh, being murdered in a genocide in Gaza in real time, a televised genocide. And uh, I can tell you, and I know that uh, many of you know, it's uh, it's a difficult experience. Uh, there are moments of of many many moments of of sadness and despair, anger, uh, hopelessness, uh, hope. We we cycle between hope and hopelessness. I don't know how many times a day, of um, pride in our people and their resistance fierce pride, a deserved pride in their resistance. And uh, also, we feel, I think, our, our hearts are healed somewhat by seeing the global outpouring, the growing outpouring of solidarity, and the faith and confidence that this solidarity will translate into action, it has to translate into action. Um, the hardest day was getting the news 
on Thursday that Rifat had been murdered the prior evening and targeted. The evidence is very clear that Rifat was targeted. The Euro Mediterranean Human Rights Organization, um, headed by Rami Abdu, another dear friend of um, Rifat, investigated and spoke both with Rifat's re relatives and close friends. And it's certain that Rifat was targeted. The attack that killed Rifat and his brother Salah and his sister Asma and four children of the family, three of uh, his sister and one of his brother, uh, was a missile that was targeted specifically at uh, Rifat's sister's apartment. It wasn't uh, one of these airstrikes that took down the whole building. And we know that in the days just prior to his murder, Rifat had received a call when he was at a UN school sheltering uh, in the Tufah neighborhood of Gaza City, warning him that uh, he was a target. And uh, it's not exactly clear who called him, but it's also not a mystery who, who calls up and threatens people in Gaza. Rifat was um, well known to the Israelis. He was a target of their propaganda campaigns, of their defamation and their lying. And he wrote uh, on uh, a few weeks before he was murdered, after his house was bombed uh, in late October, that uh, some of his uh, relatives worried that it was because of his outspokenness in the media. He had been on international media many times, and it may well have been that the first airstrike that attacked his own house in uh, October was because of the media interviews that he was doing. He had a big target on him. And despite that, uh, Rifat wouldn't be silent. He continued to speak out. He continued to show us the way. Uh, we wrote uh, in our piece at the Electronic Intifada on the day we learned of Rifat's murder that Rifat was not fearless. And I say that because throughout these past two months, I, like many of us, was in daily touch with Rifat. We stayed in contact uh, mostly through WhatsApp. And he often described great, great fear. Uh, the word he used, which is a word I've heard from many people in Gaza, indescribable terror that people went through. So Rifat wasn't fearless, but he was brave and he was courageous. Because for me, the definition of courage is to continue to do what you know to be right in spite of the fear you feel. And Rifat did that. I want to share with you, um, I, I found it quite uh, comforting in, I found it quite comforting in the last few days to read some of the messages Rifat and I exchanged over the past two months. And, you know, in the midst of all this, we 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 all exchange messages. Our phones are all blowing up all the time, and we don't necessarily read or notice things the first time we see them, or we forget about them. And uh, so, going through some of those messages, I I came across these ones that I I'd, I'd like to share with you. And uh, I'm going to share my screen and share this uh, this window here. These were on November the 2nd of this year. Uh, so almost a month into the genocide. And uh, at that point, Rifat's home had been bombed a few days earlier and he was in a shelter. And uh, he wrote, I'm getting news. They've brought down a whole building we still have everything inside. We could not save anything. I have thousands of books I collected over the years. And then I replied to him, 
that he would have at least another 30 years ahead of him co to collect books, maybe even 50 years. Uh, unfortunately, he only had another 35 days. But then what he wrote there, I think sums Rifat up. He said, all those pieces you publish for my students keep me going. And uh, he was referring to the many articles that we have had the privilege of publishing over the years at the Electronic Intifada, and particularly in the last two months. And I can tell you that Rifat never stopped working, even when he was going from shelter to shelter with his family, even when he was looking for food. He believed so much in the mission of telling the world the truth about Gaza and supporting and nurturing his students to do so. He would be sending me um, articles from his students by WhatsApp that he had helped uh, them to edit uh, or he had helped them to write. He would be giving me their contacts and saying, so-and-so has an article that they want to send you. He did that as long as he could and as much as he could. And I wanted to share that message. All those pieces you publish for my students keep me going. Primarily as a message to his students who are watching this now, uh, wherever they are in the world, or who may watch it later, uh, to know that Almost every time I spoke to Rifat or had contact with Rifat, he expressed he expressed how much how much he loved you and believed in you. And I know that you, we will continue the journey that we started with Rifat. This is not the end, it's a beginning. And that's the way Rifat would want it to be. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Um, there's, when, when um, the environmentalist Berta Caceres was murdered, a few years ago by uh, by imperialists. One of the chants was, um, Berta didn't die, she multiplied. And I think that's, that applies here. If I did not die, he multiplied and he will continue to multiply through this love that we have for him and through the generations, through the many people whose lives he, had he has touched um, and his work that will live on for all of us. And I, I want to bring on um, Abdullah. Uh, are you are you with us, Abdullah? Can you turn your camera on? <clears throat> yes, I'm here. Uh, and uh, do you, can you introduce yourself uh, to everyone and um, just tell yeah. us what, what you mean? Uh, so my name is Abdullah. Uh, I am studying my master's in New York here. Um, I've known Rifat uh, since 2016, 2017. Uh, at first he was my university professor. And I just remember from day one, the first lecture we had, I felt this was a different person who's gonna leave uh, a profound impact uh, on my life. And he actually did. Um, he was the one who pushed me to apply for Fulbright, I I uh, I didn't think I was able to get it, but he pushed me, he encouraged me, and now I'm here uh, because of him. Uh, Rifat was uh, one of the people, one of the few people who had who had left a very profound impact on my life as a person and as a professional. Um, he taught me and hundreds of other students to to believe in ourselves to. Uh, he taught us that we deserve more, that we should ask for more because we deserve more. Um, 
every time I was telling uh, Suzanne, every time uh, I would go out with Rifat to to the beach, and we would, you know, eat grapes and figs, and he loved uh, uh, those outings. Um, I would feel like inside, and I think that many of my other friends who were there felt the same thing. I would feel strong, um, empowered, and free. Because before Rifat, and this is not a, an exaggeration, before Rifat, we were just regular kids coming out from high school who knew nothing about the outside world, who were afraid to speak, who we, could, we didn't think that we can change, that we could change anything around us. But with the guidance of Rifat, with his help, with his uh, 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 education that he gave us, uh, he transformed us into into other rifats, if that makes sense, because they may have killed him, but uh, they have created, or he has created uh, thousands of other rifats who are going to carry on uh, his fight after he's gone. Um, so yeah, this was kind of a, a snippet of what rifat uh, means to me. And uh, <clears throat> even though we were doing this, um, I still choose to believe that he is alive somewhere. And yeah, it's it's tough to, to think that because Rifat was, to me, for some reason, I felt he was a superhuman. When we go, we would go out uh, in his car and he would tell us stories. He would actually talk about Suzanne or Ali. Um, and he would, you know, he, he was so funny and he had these witty jokes and stories. In my mind, I didn't think he was he, he was gonna die some, at some point in his life. I, I, to me, when I heard the news that Rifat was uh, killed by Israel, I didn't believe it. And I texted one of my friends, Abdul Rahim. I told him, uh, after, like hours after that, I told him, I think this is a rumor. This is impossible. This cannot happen. And I still choose to believe that he is alive somewhere, at least in us. Thank you. Shukran, Abdullah. Abdullah, fi kteer min al musharikin bihbu yimkan yismau kelma minak bilogha al Arabiya. Anna musharikin min jamia anha al Alam is a Susan or hadam bitaba fi min Almania. في من إيطاليا في من تونس في من مصر من كل أنحاء العالم في بعض الناس يمكن ما بتتحدث باللغة الإنجليزية عبد الله باختصار كتير كيف أثر عليك خلاك أنت تكتب عن فلسطين وتكتب عن غزة أظن هذا هو أهم إشي أنا بعتقد أنه عمله الله يرحمه رفعت أنه وصل صوت فلسطين وصل صوت غزة بالذات لأنه دايما غزة بتروح على الأخبار لما يكون في اعتداء على غزة لكن هو كان في الأيام الهدوء كان صوتكم أنتوا اللي عالي عن غزة فإذا ممكن بس تحكي كيف هو كان يشرح لكم هاي الجزئية كيف ليه صوتكم أنتوا كشباب وشبات كان مهم رفعت الله يرحمه أه... علمنا دائما إنه نتحدى المنظومة القائمة والمسيطرة دائما بغض النظر إيش هي يعني حتى في في دراستنا الجامعية كان دائما يعلمنا إنه إذا مش عاجبك النظام إذا حابب تحكي إذا حابب تصرخ وتعلي صوتك يعني لازم تعمل الشيء هذا فهذا كان أحد الأسباب وصارت كتير قصص خلال دراستنا الجامعية هو كان دائما في خلفية المشهد يشجعنا وي ويمكننا من انه احنا نحكي ونعلي صوتنا ضد مثلا سياسات في الجامعة او سياسات دراسية عنا كان هو دائما يشجعنا فصار هو بعدها اخذنا من من مستوى الجامعة هذا لمستوى القضية الفلسطينية صار دائما علمنا انه لازم نتحدى الرواية الغربية الصهيونية اللي بتنزع انسانيتنا احنا وبتخلينا احنا مجرد ارقام ألف وألفين وثلاثة آلاف واحد لكن لا قصة لنا لا حكاية لا مشاعر لا لا أهل فهذا كان أحد الأهم الأسباب وكان دائما يقولنا إحنا ما عمره حدا فينا فكر إنه بيقدر يكتب قصة أو بيقدر يكتب شعر أو فلما درسنا الشعر مع رفعت 
كان الـ كان الـ يعني الـ الواجب الرئيسي او التكليف الرئيسي اللي لازم نعمله انه لازم نكتب قصائد فانه احنا كلنا صرنا نطلع في بعض انه احنا احنا نكتب مين احنا؟ احنا ارقام كيف احنا نكتب قصائد؟ فهو قال لا انتم مش ارقام انتم ادباء وانتم المفروض تكونوا شعراء فلسطين وغزه بتحتاجكم بتحتاجكم تعلوا صوتكم دائما في كل وقت مش بس في في وقت الحرب فبس فقدر رفعت علينا لا ينتهي صراحه شكرا عبد عبد الله maybe you can just mention what you told us earlier about what he told you about Ali so uh, I, I'm a big fan of Ali uh, I I always follow his work and I used to always talk Rifat and I would always uh, talk about مش عارف احكي بالعربي ولا بالانجلش عربي or English by the way <laughs> okay so uh, Uh, we used to always talk about Ali behind his back, of course. Um, and he used to always tell me uh, how much he is impressed by what Ali does. And he has this saying uh, that if you're going to defend Palestine, if you're going to speak out about Palestine, you have to be as vicious as Ali is. Otherwise, shut up. This is what he used to tell me. So uh, this is actually when I see it, Ali's work, when I remember Rafat's words about Ali, I always try to raise the bar in my defense of my cause, my people, because I want to be as vicious as Ali, sometimes even more vicious. Thank you, Abdullah. Susan, may, may I just uh, have a word? First of all, uh, I, that's the first time I, I heard that story when when Abdullah said it just before we went live, and it, it touched me very greatly. Um, Rifat was actually an example for me, the way he combined his very, very, very clear principles and his brave speech with his incredible sense of humor. And all of us who knew Rifat know, know how funny he was. And he, he was funny even in the worst imaginable circumstances. And it was a gift he had and a gift he gave us. And uh, so I'm very touched by those words. I just uh, want to say that, um, unfortunately, I have to disconnect now because of an, another engagement. But I just want to say before I go that uh, the Electronic Intifada live stream on Monday at noon Eastern time will be dedicated to Rifat also, and we'll have uh, many of Rifat's students um, and friends who will contribute there as well. I hope you can join us. And the way to find out more is just go to electronicintifada.net and in the top of the website, you'll see get updates, sign up for our email list, and we will send you all the information for the live stream and also Our front page of our website, most of the articles there right now are written by students of Rifat, writers that he nurtured. So we owe him a great debt. The reportage that's coming out of Gaza now, I say, and I'm very proud of this, I believe that the Electronic Intifada is publishing the most writing directly now out of Gaza in the English language than any other publication in the world, perhaps, and that is largely thanks to Rifat. We owe him that, and uh, we, we, we appreciate it greatly. So I will listen to the rest of the contributions in the recording later. Thank you for having me, and uh, my love to everyone. Thank you, Ali. So let me just um, say, I mean, we're, I'm going to, uh, Samad and I are going to call on um, on you guys, but feel free to just, you know, if you want to, if something sparks a memory or something, just raise your hands. Like this is, you know, we're all family and friends here and, and we are here to love on Rifat. Um, so uh, why don't we, um, is Nadia, Nadia, are you, uh, can you come on camera and talk to us? Uh Yes, then. hello. I just rather not really turn on my camera. I don't know if that's okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, 
Yeah, whatever makes you comfortable, Nadia. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, uh, my name is Nadia. Uh, I was one of Rafat's students. Um, uh, two years ago, I finished my BA and I traveled to Egypt uh, to do my MA. And uh, I knew Rafat from my first year. I met him in 2017. I was then uh, a shy, awkward first year student. Um, I had my uh, secret in in initiatives, writing poetry and short stories that I really didn't share with people. And then I once shared with uh, Dr. Rafat a poem I wrote that he encouraged me to, to read in front of uh, an audience really in front of the class. And then he kind of helped me edit it and read it in front of a, a larger audience. I think that was a turning point uh, in my life. I want, I was trying to kind of um, write some points about the influence uh, uh, Dr. Rafat had on me and on students. And I tried to, and at least I'll try to make uh, my uh, little speech a bit more general. Um, because I wanted to kind of speak to uh, the students that are not here. And I just want to point out that most of Arafat students are uh, not here, especially those in Gaza, they can't really join. Um, so whatever we say here is just a small example of the enormous uh, influence Arafat uh, had uh, on our lives. Um, I would say that uh, Professor Rafat was a very supportive of uh, youth. He believed in us and helped us discover our potential. He saw students as an asset that can lead to change and that can help Palestine somehow. Uh, he was so patient with us, giving us time to grow and make mistakes, improve, and he carefully kind of guided us as we do. I don't really recall him ever dismissing anything that a student in class said as useless or too mundane. Even when we, uh, the colleagues of that, that, uh, that student, were not patient enough to really listen uh, till the end. And I think an example of that is really the poem that I read. I remember when I first read it in class, the students were not interested, but Professor Rifat was listening very carefully, taking notes, and then he made me read it again, and only then uh, more students started <laughs> becoming interested somehow. And I think this really uh, applies um, uh, to plenty of, of other students uh, like myself. He uh, cared about what, what we wrote. I think teaching for him was not just, you know, about grades and just getting the task done. He really wanted um, us to explore uh, what we can do and help us uh, become something more than just, you know, students who receive a grade at the end of the term. He tried as much as he can um, to help us publish our works and stories. And it happened with me. He helped me publish um, a number of, uh, of stories I wrote and articles that he himself uh, edited. I would say that he was uh, too stubborn in his insistence on our creativity. He was always mm -hmm. asking us to write a story or a poem as part of the course assessment or to even improve a grade some, uh, sometimes. And he loved when we made Palestine uh, a theme. He didn't require that, but he uh, was proud of us when we used that as a theme. I would say that he uh, was thinking of us as his students all the time, and he was coming up uh, with different activities and initiatives to connect us with uh, the world. I mean, uh, as you know, uh, students in Gaza can't really travel uh, as often as other students can do. Exchange programs are very limited. So he would try to connect us with uh, professors online uh, from all around the world, with writers, with activists. And another uh, example um, that like, happened uh, with me is that when he learned that I'm, uh, I'm going to be studying at AUC here in, in Cairo, uh, he asked if I can uh, connect some of uh, my, my professors at AUC with him so that he can help students in Gaza kind of um, use the experience of uh, the professors uh, the professors here. And we really did a couple of sessions uh, on translation and translation as, uh, as a political act with the help of some um, professors at AUC. I'm not really sure uh, what else to say. 
I did an exchange program during my, uh, my bachelor years. He was the person who wrote my recommendation letters. In fact, he's the one who encouraged me to apply to the program. When he learned that I'm interested in applying to AUC, he was also encouraging, also wrote my recommendation letter, was always interested to, to know about how my MA is going. He actually promised me to read my thesis when it's done. It was supposed to, I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. Uh, I'm supposed to finish it in a month and he <clears throat> was supposed to read it. Yeah, well, I think I would agree with what Abdullah said about, and what Susan said about how um, Professor Rafat is, didn't really die, he multiplied, and how it's important for us to carry out the project uh, that he started of talking and resisting through writing and believing in the power of the word and what it can do and how far it, it can reach. Yeah. I think maybe that's about it. Uh, Nadia, shukran la masharik had the liktab, inshallah, I couldn't be in Gaza writes back. Oh, and about Zekar, Lama Sadar liktab, a milt moabella, I know Ahmed Zamili, a true talk, but Nemish Tabana, Marawan Yeri, but is a law had the Tala and the contents. بعت الكتاب مين اللي كتب قصص وروايات عن غزة وعن حياته حنلاقي إنه يمكن الأغلبية كانوا إناث كانوا بنات يعني في أسماء زي روان وزي حنان حبشي نور السوسي سارة علي سميحة علوان وكل واحد نور البورنو هل كان رفعت مهتم إنه يكون فعلا صوتكم أنتوا كبنات من غزة يكون عالي ما كان هو بس مهتم بالشباب مع احترامي الشديد للشباب الموجودين ولا اللي درسهم بس أنا بحس إنه هو كان يحس إنه صوتك أنت كأنثى أو كإنسانة غزوية برضو مهم ولازم يوصل هل أنت كنت تحسي بهاي الطريقة؟ آه، بتحب أجاوب بالعربي ولا بالإنجليش؟ بالعربي عشان إحنا عنا ناس على الشكلين تمام. في بعرف بس عربي وفي بعرفه بس إنجليزي الصراحة أنا بدي أحكي إنه كلمة فيمينزم إحنا كطلاب في, في غزة يمكن أول مرة عرفناها من دكتور رفعت عرفنا شو يعني فيمينزم وشو يعني نسوية وكده من دكتور رفعت طبعا أنا كنت بحس إنه هو بيهتم إنه صوت البنات يوصل بالعكس هو كان يعني يشوف انه سم... يعني ساعات بيبقى في حاجز خجل عند البنات وهو يعني يعني الحاجات الحاجات المجتمعيه الموجوده فهو كان يعني يح... يحاول يخلينا نتحداها وكثير كان بيامن بانه البنات بتقدر تكتب البنات بتقدر تعمل هو حتى كان بيشارك في مشاريع تانية بحثيه من خلال الجامعه فيها جندر امباورمنت بطريقة أو بأخرى أنا كنت بشتغل معه على مشروع هو ما كمل للأسف يعني كان مفروض يكمل قريبا اسمه جندر بيست فيولنس إن بالستين وكنا بنجمع قصص لسيدات يعني كبيرة في السن في فلسطين وكنا نسمع منهم فولك تيلز عشان نشوف أثر يعني القصص الشعبية على حياتهم وعلى تجاربهم فهو كان مهتم يعني بانه يعني احنا التيم اللي شغال معه كان في يعني كان في بنات وفي نفس الوقت احنا كنا بنوثق قصص سيدات فلسطينيات وتجاربهم في الحياه فاكيد بقدر اقول انه هو كان فيمينست ويمكن اول فيمينست كثير من طلاب بيتعاملوا معهم <تصفيق> شكرا ناديه سوزن Thank you, Nadia. Um, I am. Um, <clears throat> I was also, I think, as we all have been doing, going back and looking at our um, previous correspondence with um, with Rifat, and I, uh, I realized I, <clears throat> our, our correspondence, at least on email, goes back to 2012 when he was doing his um, his MA in London. 
um, and he and he was teaching. He was doing a part of his dissertation on one of the chapters in my book, and um, and I realized that a lot of our correspondence was on Twitter in my account that was permanently suspended, and I. I'm feeling like that is the greatest loss of that um, that Twitter account right now is not having that correspondence now from him, because he talked about a lot of you, a lot of his students, and I, you know, um, not knowing a lot of his students personally, um, I, you know, I didn't know that you know who the names were, and I and I feel this sort of desperation now to want to go back and identify. Um, each of you that he spoke so lovingly about and, and wanted to promote. Um, so uh, it's so nice to hear you all, um, to hear the emotion, um, the way, not just how he advanced um, your intellectual life, but how he made you all feel um, as as any true educator um, empowers his students, that's 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 what he did. Um, why don't yeah, we? Susan, sorry, but there is a wonderful uh, message from Muhammad Lafi that he says uh, today uh, Rifat was mentioned in the Palestine March in London, and uh, some girl read his poem. So this is so so important for us to know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, I think, um, I think we're going to see more and more of this. Um, like, like I said earlier, Rifat uh, did not die. He is multiplying and will multiply and um, through all of you. Um, should we, uh, um, Ahmed uh, or and like I said, if any of you want to just jump in, please just raise your hand. Samad and I will will call on you. If you do speak Arabic, um, please speak both English and Arabic for uh, for the audience. Um, Ahmed, are you comfortable going next? Hi, Ikhwan. Uh... Um, I'm, I'm Ahmed Nihad. Um, uh, um, I'm one of the thousands of uh, Dr. Rifat's students. I had the privilege of uh, of sharing um, lots of memories with him, and um, being from the same neighborhood, uh, from Shijaiya, even though he always tried to. Uh, to tell me that I'm not a true Shijai because I was born uh, outside Shijaiya. And um, um, I, I, I met uh, Dr. Rifat. He wasn't Dr. Rifat at the time, he was Mr. Rifat. I, I met him when I was 12. Um, in a, um, that was the first time I met him. I was uh, in, a, in a media training somewhere. I don't know what I was doing there back then. I was um I was this shy kid among all these adults in the in the corner of the room. And um he approached me after the um the training that we gave and he I guess one of the one of the gifts he had, one of them like he is one of the most gifted people I know, and one of the gifts he has is discovering the potential in like one meeting, one 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 meeting, fifteen minutes with him were always enough uh, for him to probably turn all your um, all your life in a different direction. Um, he started the conversation with me. He learned that I uh, I love football, um, that I also a uh, fan of Barcelona like he is, and. Um, he um knew that I'm on social media and like uh, that I'm interested in that and like he he made me feel that I'm doing something big like posting stuff about football social media and um he told me I should do that in English I was like and 
I, I, I met him several times um, in the following years, and every time he'd always remember that um, um, that um, uh, I'm, the, I'm a Messi fan, and uh, he'd always start a conversation with that to break the silence, to break my shyness, and to make me um, to make me uh, talk and speak, and uh, um, and every time he kept. Uh, reminding me that I need to improve my English and that I need to um to start writing in English and um, how important it was. He followed me on social media everywhere, and I didn't really realize back then um the privilege he he gave me um with that. And then later on, um, I joined the university and um the English department. And then I I realized since like Abdullah said, um Abdullah and Nadia are my classmates. And um um since since the first lecture, we all came out of the lecture, all of us, um Abdullah um and I and all all, all of our classmates and like we were like yeah, for the first time I feel stupid. I feel stupid. I feel there are lots of things that I that I need to know. There are lots of things that um I still don't know. And um um and we all knew that that we are we're finally doing something and learning something. He introduced I remember he introduced us like Nadia said to to many terms and many many concepts that we we heard the first time from him but like one of the things i, I really mem remember is white washing it was like the first time i've ever heard the, the term white washing and um he 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 picked a book it was an introduction to english literature course and then we took multi, many courses with him afterwards and he picked a book that he loved so much and like he kept praising the book all the time but then all of a sudden like three, four lectures on, he started criticizing the book, the book he loves. And and he taught me the first time how, how you can appreciate something so much but still criticize it and how he criticized the book for whitewashing um, and um, for um, kicking um, certain people of uh, color or certain people of different nationalities or different opinions from, from the picture of uh, the history of English literature. And then in, in, in the same, in, in the first exam he gave us, one of the questions was asking us to criticize the book, to, 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 um, to say where the book failed, to, um, <clears throat> to talk about uh, or, or to cover certain, um, uh, certain aspects. And um, he, always, he always said, one of the things, I, one of the sayings I always echo and I always repeat, um, because he he taught me, he taught all of us, whenever we do anything mischievous or anything mean or anything, you know, all teenagers would do, he'd look at us and say in Arabic, um, something, something like that. And um, he always said that I was um uh mischievous and like he tells stories he tell us all the stories of how he was um uh making it hard for his professors telling us that i did that um i so i know all the tricks i did all of them so don't try to to do them on, on me but then when we do them he, we we see how proud he, he he is of us doing those same tricks so he encouraged us um to be um courageous to be unapologetic, even against him, um, and um, as Abdullah said, he he taught us to do this from the basic level and um, uh, um, and way above. Um, I kept uh, taking all the courses he gave. One of um, we pushed so hard. to uh to give us um another course he gets they, they were like refusing um he he encouraged me uh, uh and abdullah to to mock the system and the university in front of the whole university um because we disliked so many things as students 
Uh, and he was true that we mocked him sometimes and he liked that uh, we made so many memes about him and not only did he appreciate them, but he used them when he, when he found them uh, worthy and funny and courageous and true. Um, I also had the privilege to um, to work with him um, when I finished my my bachelor's. Um, I was appointed with Abdullah um, as teaching assistant and Khalid. Khalid is here as well. Uh, he's raising his hand. Uh, Abdul Rahim as well and uh, Malak. Um, he we were teaching assistants, and I remember how hard he fought for us to not only be teaching assistants, um, because we didn't have to be teaching assistants. He fought for us to be teaching assistants to work in the university. And then he fought for us to um, uh, not only be, uh, he believed in us in ways we didn't um, believe in ourselves. Um, he fought for us to uh, teach uh, second year and third year and fourth, uh, fourth year uh, courses. Uh, and like I remember um, he called me on a Wednesday and the, the semester would start on a Saturday. And he called me on Wednesday and he was like, you're going to start Saturday teaching Elizabethan literature. And I was like, I have two days to to prepare for that. And he's like, uh, yeah, out of all the options I know, you're the, the best person who can do that. And be like, I know that's not true, but like when he says it, when, when, when he tells you this, he always makes you believe that you don't want to fail him. He somehow in a way believes that you can do that. And he made every one of us feel so special about um, his relationship with him and so confident about, him, about himself. Um, um, and you, I, I, I can sense this in, in myself and also in every, in every one of us, every one of his, uh, his students. I remember um, in, in, in one of the workshops we, uh, we had with him uh, on creative writing, he'd give us prompts and give us like two or three minutes to, to write a poem um, um, about this topic or sometimes stupid mixture of words from everywhere. And he'd like write, write a poem on this. And he used to push us to uh, our limits to, to take everything um, we, can, we can do. And, I, I was never confident. I'm still. I still never uh, believed that I can do uh, something. But then, so I didn't share any of them of the things I I wrote. Abdullah would like write something and read it, and I find it really interesting. And uh, Nadia would write something and say it. Khaled, Malak, um, and all the rest of our friends who are now in uh, in Gaza. Um, I don't for, want to forget uh, any one of them. They would like write things, and they would. They, they they would really be beautiful and like I, I was never com comfortable or confident enough to to share this so he um uh shared the picture of um, the bucker kids who were killed in in uh, in the on, in the beach in 2014 and he was like okay so now this is um a prompt you need to write a, a poem um um about um about this and Noor Hamad uh make a protector wrote one of the most perfect uh, poems ever that he started teaching afterwards as he taught so many of the texts that his students uh, has written. And then I also, I wrote something and I was like never confident in it. And, and then he shared another prompt, uh, prompt and he was like, Ahmed, we haven't heard from you. Now you're gonna read what you, uh, you'd you write. And then I had to to, to, to write anything just because I, ha I have to read it. And then I read it and he's like, um, that's, that's perfect. That's, that's the best um, uh, lines of lines of poetry I've ever uh, heard, and I know it's not. I know he liked John Donne more, but um, that's that's how he he always believed in us more than um, we believed in in ourselves. And like he was like he treated me as if I'm some kind of I don't know. Uh, he was like stop there, and he took a picture of 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 my handwriting of, the, of that poem, and like he made a big deal out of it, and like. He made me not only in this um, uh, time, but like uh, all the times after that, every time he pushed me to write and he'd like bully me, literally bully me to write. Uh, and then after I write anything, the stupidest thing ever, he'd like be like, this is the best thing um, ever. 
And then I had the privilege to work with him and to train uh, students with him. And I saw, I saw his heart burn for every potential that is um, not fulfilled, for every opportunity that's lost. I saw him being angry and like shouting and like, with all the enthusiasm in the world because um, he believed someone can do something, but they they couldn't either because they were lazy or because um they wanted but like they were prevented for some reason or another and so many reasons uh for our potentials to be um not fulfilled um i don't know i can i can speak volumes about uh about this man and it will never be uh enough but like one thing i said today at the protest here in dundee going on in Gaza now from the ground, they know it thanks to Rafat, either because of what Rafat writes or because of what his students do, because he trained thousands of students, thousands of Gaza's youth, men, women, um, uh, uh, to write, to unapologetically, uh, unapologetically write and talk about Gaza and about Palestine. Um, last night, I, I couldn't sleep and I started um, re-watching his um, recorded lectures on YouTube and I came across um, the one where he teaches war poetry and like he, he talked for like with, with the students for like the first 30 minutes about tour and what it meant and um, he, he was talking about how Israel um, purposefully and intentionally kill, uh, kills poets and writers. And he was like, we should never say even the poets because it's not an exception. They target the poets, they target the writers because they're afraid of the word, they're afraid of, of the poem. And um, uh, um, I guess, uh, I guess they do, I believe they, Stupid, because if they if they believe that by killing um, Rafat they would shut him up. I know they will not, and I know that we continue doing everything uh, he taught us to to do. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, I'm going to read two of the comments in the <clears throat> in the chat. First one is Mashallah Yerifat Kharajit Ajial M Banat Ulad Razil Abakra. And then there's another one um that was commenting on what you said, Ahmad. It said, Dr. Rifat used to say, Don't out rifating me. Don't try out rifating me. <laughs> um so uh we have yeah, a sorry. Uh, there is also Abdul Rahim said something in the comments. Abdul Rahim was also one of uh, Dr. Rifat's best friends, he he said something he always uh, said to us. Um, if Rifat can write this, not Rifat, if Abu Lara'ir can write this trying to, I don't know, humble himself, can write this, you can, everybody can. And yes, that's something uh, we should remember him for. Thank you. Samad, I'll turn it. Um, I'll turn it to you to moderate the next steps. Yeah, we have uh, two people uh, raised their hands. Uh, Malak uh, Zakut, and uh, I can see maybe uh, Abdullah Osama. Uh, so Malak, uh, I don't know if you want to. Uh, uh, or Musab Abu Toha. So uh, ladies first. Yeah, Musab and Ruhla. Uh, uh, Malak, who Fiktir, uh, by the way, from the people who are not part of the panelists, would like to ask questions. And I'm getting also uh, DMs uh, through the Twitter feed. So there is a lot of interest. And we have people from Nigeria and from Iran and from Australia 
and uh, from London, from Tunisia and Egypt, I can't keep up, uh, but people are extremely supportive. Uh, it's up to you if you want to uh, speak in English. And um, if we can, like, if possible, keep it uh, a lot, like five minutes so we can give everyone a chance to speak. And then, uh, you know, you can come back if you have more to say. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we do. Go ahead. All right. Great. So I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Malak Zakut. I was of doc one of Dr. Yafat's uh, students, friends. I'd like to think so from the close circle. Um, I knew Dr. Yafat in 2018 after like six days after I lost my dad and he was a dad to me. If I taught me Elizabethan literature, romantic literature and poetry as curricular courses, creative writing, literary translation, fiction for children, fiction for Palestine and writing for media and it goes on as extracurricular courses. And then we worked together for another one year with uh, also with Ahmed Nihad. I wrote some things that are not even a story because I couldn't uh, craft a story. I just couldn't. So. I um, tried to um, I tried to introduce Dr. Rifat from the tiniest of things he used to do that made him so special. Dr. Rifat always walks fast. You see him from afar, and you know he had he has a purpose to fulfill in this life. He he is, and I'm not gonna say was because it's never was. He's the kind of person who you feel privileged to be around. You feel proud that of all the people he knew, and let me tell you, they are a lot, you ended up being in his close circle. He believed in me when I myself gave up on me. I wrote my first poem ever under his guidance, or to be more accurate, under his threats. He gave me and my classmates, Ahmad, Abdullah, Khaled, um, Nadia, he gave me and my classmates 10 minutes to craft a poem inspired by some pictures he projected. I worked at places I never dreamt of working at, all under his recommendations, um, follow-up and assistance. He's the kind of person who's always there for you, no matter what, no matter how busy he was. He's the kind of person I seek advice from even whenever in doubt. Even if I ask my mom, she goes, did you ask Dr. Rifat though? What did he say about it? And as Iman Bashir puts it, He's family to me, he's family to us. He taught me how to meme in the most hilarious ways. He's the coolest of professors in the whole world. I mean, who on earth uses his own crazy photos as stickers on WhatsApp and then circulates them among his friends? Sorry. Rifat is the kind of person who praises you behind your back, but in your face, he makes you feel like you could have done way better. Rifat is the giving kind. You ask him for a piece of information and then he ends up sending you seven books as sources. Rifat was the breadwinner for 50 members or more of his family. He's in a better place now, no more looking for food or water. Food and water come to him. Israel killed Rifat only to make a hundred Rifats of his friends, students, and those who took him as a role model. So sorry to break it to you, but Rifat lives through us. You know what's so sad here is that I'm used to scribbling some drafts and discussing them with Dr. Rifat so I can trim some ideas, stretch others, and get inspired by his instant, effortless, yet amazing ideas. But this time I'm writing about him and he's no longer here to edit with me. He taught us less is more in poetry. And I think he could write a poem that could extend to 10 pages, but he chose, he chose for it to be very brief about death because death comes like without knocking. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much, uh, Malak. And I want you to know that there are people writing in Arabic and saying, Shukran lil musharaka wa shukran lakum musharakatna khibratkum ma hadal insan al adim rahimahullah. Nahnu narifu mun khilalkum fa shukran lakum wa shukran malak to our uh, audience in English. There are people who don't really know Rifat, did not know 
before Rifat, but now they are uh, knowing him through his students and through this uh, Zoom meeting. So uh, Malak, uh, keep writing and keep uh, his memory alive. And it's very important that this is being taped because one day his children will watch this and know how many people loved him and how much he affected you and influenced your lives. For Allah yirhamu, um, uh, uh, I think we have uh, Musab uh, Abu uh, Toha. Tfaddal Musab. Uh, thank you so much for this very, very important event. And thank you, Malak, for the heartbreaking words about Rifat and the true emotions. I remember uh, the, f the first time I talked to Rifat during the uh, aggression against Gaza uh, was the second day. Uh, the BBC called me, the BBC radio called me, and they asked me to, to join them. And they asked me to, to recommend some other people to talk with them. So just 10 minutes before the program started, I was trying to call Rifat and he picked up the phone and he said, yes, let's do it together. And then at the same time, uh, I was in touch with Malak. So Malak and I and Rifat, we were joining uh, the same uh, event uh, on the BBC. And during that uh, call, uh, Malak's uh, house, I think, was uh, bombarded. So she had to leave the, the, the interview uh, sooner than she was supposed to. I would say Rifat is uh, is more than sorry uh, a friend. Sorry to interrupt, Musab. I'm really sorry to interrupt. I think that's another Malik you're talking about. Yes, my house was bombed, uh, but no, that's not that's not me. Mm. Sorry. Okay, no problem. Okay, so there was another Malik. Uh, so <laughs> sorry for the confusion. Um, so I would say that Rifat was more than a friend, uh, more than an editor, more than a champion of Palestinian young writers um, i didn't i have never had the chance uh, of being a student of his because when i was at the islamic university of gaza uh, he was uh, in the uk uh, i think or malaysia getting his uh, uh, degree uh, but i kept in touch with him when i was in the, in the united states and he was very very excited about uh, what i was writing um, and i i uh, Oh, Rifat, uh, for recommending me to be uh, a participant uh, with We Are Not Numbers project. So I, I, I took some screenshots from uh, my conversation with him. So that was in, uh, in, in 2015. He said, I want to recommend your name to the We Are Not Number project. Uh, if you are interested, have you heard about it? It will train you to be a writer. We, we hook you up with an American writer to teach you stuff and give you feedback. We can talk more on Tuesday, on Wednesday. Um, and then I sent him one of my poems. He said, Musab. So that was in 2015. I, I, by that time, I didn't publish any of my poetry. Now I have a book of poetry uh, that he uh, praised in front of his students. And he invited me to talk to his students about the book uh, last December. So he said, Musab, I read the poem. It's very good. With more writing, more reading, more practice, you can write amazing stuff. So he has never let anyone down. So everything is amazing to him. Because, of course, everyone has the, the talent, but they need, they need to practice and to write more and more. Um, I would like to say also that Rifat was very, very saddened by the fact that he couldn't make it to the Palestine Rights Festival in Philadelphia last September. I was in touch with him. I was asking him, hey, Rifat, what did you do with your visa? Are you coming to Egypt? Are you, where are you go ha having your uh, visa interview? And he sent to me in Arabic, it didn't work. I mean, some, some people promised to help me with exiting Gaza. I'm really uh, infuriated and, uh, and anxious. I had really great hope of getting to travel to Philadelphia. Uh, so my, my heart was broken uh, because I wanted to be with Rifat uh, in Philadelphia, not only in Gaza, because that would be a different experience. Um, Rifat really loved the strawberry. And I have this picture of him uh, holding uh, a box of strawberries that we picked together uh, in Beit Lahia. So every time I returned from a trip to the United States, he would visit me 
and he would say, okay, you are going to take us to the strawberry farms in North Gaza. So he was a, a huge lover of strawberries and and I, meet, I, I, I too, um, uh, a huge lo lover of strawberries. He loved to, bl to play pun words. Uh, so when we go to Bethlehem to pick some strawberries, we would just collect the strawberries and in a on, in a plate, and then I and another friend Walid Abu Sultan, who is a student of his, would sit together under uh, in a tent uh, next to the strawberry farm, and we will play the pun words, the, the pun game. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, most of the time he would beat uh, the, the, the both of us. Uh, Rifat also as. Uh, as Ahmed Nihad mentioned, he was a huge fan of Barcelona, uh, and me too. So whenever Barcelona uh, gets defeated, he would get angry. Sometimes with the players, they would he would say, "Why did they buy this player?" And sometimes he would be angry with the with the with the coach. Uh, he would say, "The coach should resign today." Um, so he was he was a lover of life and and. Um, a lover of food, a lover of of of, of beauty, and uh, Rifat, I was lucky to to give him a copy of my uh, poetry collection. He was the only one that I gave a copy to in Gaza, uh, and he promised me that if I if I was going to have uh, a book signing in Gaza, which I have I haven't done because of the situation in Gaza, because of my trips to the states back and forth. Um, so he he said, if you are going to have a book signing, I will be I I'll be more than happy to introduce you uh, in the uh, book signing, and I was looking forward to that moment to be introduced by Rifat and to be in conversation with him. Uh, but now Rifat is not here. There are no strawberries this year. Um, there are no books, no English literature. I think after Rifat died, no Shakespeare, no John Donne, no poetry. Uh, but because he asked us to live, to tell his tale, I think this is the only reason why we should continue to write and to talk about him and his fellow Palestinian writers and poets. Let me just, maybe because we're running short on time, um, please try and keep your comments. I know we can all speak for hours about Nifat, um, but just try and keep your comments you know, somewhat um, brief so others can get a chance. Um, we'll do this again. This isn't, you know, this isn't our, our last tribute to uh, someone as great as him. Thank you. So go ahead, Jihad, and then Helena, and then Shema. You've had your hand up for a while. Thanks. Thank you, Susan and Summer, for uh, organizing and hosting this uh, important event. Um, I will keep my remarks very, very short. And as Susan said, there is much to be said about Rifat. Um, I would like to talk about two things. I was really fortunate to be in conversation with Rifat over the past few years about his chapter that he contributed to this anthology, to this book, Light in Gaza, Writings Born of Fire which is a collection of essays and poems and pieces. Some of the authors are here on the call with us today, Musab Abu Toha, Yusuf Al Jamal. Um, and when I reached out to Rifat about the idea of writing a book that reimagines Gaza's future, but within the broader context and question of Palestinian liberation and what would that liberation look like? And the conviction that Palestinian liberation can only be possible if the Nakba, the catastrophe, ends, not just as a, as a, as a wound with marks uh, that Palestinians see every day, but also as a process of continuous ethnic cleansing and erasure and destruction of Palestinian life. So I spoke to Rifat and long story short, he wasn't sure what to write and he wasn't sure what his contribution should be. 
And of course, one thing now we know about Rifat, and everybody is familiar with, with this aspect of his story, was that Rifat empowered young people to tell their stories. However, Rifat himself, you know, though funny and nice and humble, was a private person. He did not go around talking about the details of his life. He was a dignified man and he was an honorable person. He took care of his family and there were many, many wounds in his, in his family that he didn't really talk about much. But when we were talking, Rifat told me that the situation in Gaza was getting from bad to worse. And perhaps it was about time for him too to tell his story. He told me, and I quote, Jihad, I hate exposing myself. He did not want to expose himself. He did not want to put in writing those private stories, those specific details about what his family went through from especially when it comes to his childhood and his upbringing and his youth. But Rifat told the story nonetheless, hoping that by telling these stories, we would push the international community. We would encourage the reader or the readers to take action. I know we are talking today about the importance of storytelling and the, the significant role Rifat played in empowering Palestinians in Gaza and beyond to tell their stories. But this isn't a one-way act. When the stories are told, there have there has to be people there has to be people listening and people absorbing and what's more important than that that they take action based on the understanding generated by these stories it's not easy for people to expose themselves and put their their the accounts of their pain and suffering out there so in his chapter, Enlightening Gaza, Rifat talks about different stages of his life, different chapters of his life. And the title of his chapter, Gaza asks, when shall this pass? Please read, please read Rifat's words, switching to Arabic quickly. And this is something um, that I mentioned in my uh, brief obituary for him in English, but I will repeat in Arabic. Rifat al Arir tarak irth ha'e, irth ma'rifi, adabi, ilmi, u siyasi. Sanahtaj il al kathir min al sanawat, wal juhud li fahim wa idraq, wal al ihata bi had al irth. Walakin min aham. مظاهر إرث رفعت ومن أهم إسهامات رفعت هو تحويله لتعليم اللغة الإنجليزية وتعلمها إلى فعل سياسي ومقاوم رفعت لم يتبنى اللغة الإنجليزية ولم يعلمها لتصبح أداة للانفصال عن المجتمع أو لخلق حدود طبقية بين فئة وفئة أخرى بل على العكس من ذلك تعليم رفعت للغة الإنجليزية كان جزء من من رسالته لتمكين أجيال كاملة خصوصا من الفئات المهمشة في قطاع غزة ولتحويل اللغة الإنجليزية وتعلمها والتحدث بها وممارستها لفعل سياسي نستطيع من خلاله كسر الحصار الفكري والأكاديمي الذي فرض ويستمر فرضه على قطاع غزة لذلك من المهم علينا كعرب اليوم نتحدث باللغة الإنجليزية أن ننتبه إلى هذا الجزء من إرث رفعت 
ونتبناه ونحوله إلى ممارسة حقيقية في حياتنا لأن تعلم اللغة يجب أن يكون جزء من هذه الرسالة وجزء من فعلنا السياسي والمقاوم بشكل يومي وبشكل مستمر رحم الله رفعة العرير أبو عمر رح نشتاق لك الله يرحمك ويصبرنا جميعا على فراقك ويعيننا على أنه نحمل الرسالة اللي تركتها شكرا جزيلا لكم Thank you everyone And God bless you all Thank you, Jihad Aish. Um, <clears throat> I want to, uh, so I think our Zoom is going to end around four o'clock. And so I want to reiterate that um, uh, if everyone can just be brief, I know we have a lot to say. I'm going to take just a short um, moderator liberty and um, tell you that Jihad and I were talking just a couple of days before he was murdered. And he told me that he was volunteering with the local municipality. And he was trying to figure out how to find food for the remaining lion that was still alive in the zoo because a lot of the animals had starved to death. Um, and I know he was himself trying to find, um, find food for his family and uh, water as well. So I just want to just uh, uh, say that as a point um, to, ex you know, just to underscore what a gentle, soul he was and how generous he was and kind. Um, so Helena, if you can just keep it, you know, less than two minutes. And then Shema, um, uh, Khaled, and then Muhammad al-Khatib. So again, just please keep it brief um, so everybody can speak. And then maybe Rawan, uh, Hi, everyone. And uh, big thanks to Susan and Samar. For, for organizing this really important nedwa. Um, I wish I could speak in Arabic, but my Arabic is very rusty and I'm uh, very mustahiyya um, about speaking Arabic. So anyway, here I am. So I am really proud to be the uh, publisher of Gaza Writes Back and of Gaza Unsilenced, two books that uh, Rifat um edited, co-edited in the case of Gaza Unsilenced. And I did this as part of a long project to bring the voices of Palestinians to the English speaking world. Um, I've published other books as well, including of course, the Gaza Kitchen Cookbook, which I hope you all enjoy. Um, and another great book by uh, Leila Al-Haddad, um, Gaza Mom, which was, I th maybe it was the first book that I published when I started my publishing house back in 2010. Um, so in 2014, when we published uh, Gaza Writes Back, uh, we were really pleased to be able to bring Rifat and um, this guy called Yusuf al-Jamal, I don't know him very well, but uh, he claims to be known as uh, Rifat's arch nemesis. Uh, maybe he can clarify that for us. But anyway, and uh, Rowan Yeri, so Rowan, it's good to see you on here as well. Um, we had planned to bring Sarah Ali as well, but we couldn't, so we had this big... Uh, placard that we carried around with us saying Sarah Ali should be here. I think it was um, the Israeli, this, this really inhumane system of tansik that they have, um, whereby they they lock people into, into Gaza. Um, this is such a, 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 a searingly sad moment for all of us who knew and loved Rifat. And, and one of the things that makes me more sad, additionally sad, that like rubs salt into this wound is the way that the New York Times and the BBC, both of which exploited his work to try to present themselves as, you know, oh, we, we support the voices of Palestinians and whatever and whatever and in their obituaries for him, they have smeared him really badly, you know? 
it's the New York Times obituary, I can barely read it because they say, oh, you know, he, well, they brought up the thing about his comment about the baking powder, which, for goodness sake, he was, it was irony that he was using, but clearly the people who write New York Times obituaries don't have any concept or understanding of the concept of irony. And what's more, the claims that the Israelis had made about finding, you know, babies baked in ovens and whatever, like the 40 beheaded babies, they have all been disproven. So, you know, he engaged using his tool of irony, and he was correct to engage. But they bring this up as showing, you know, that he was like... Um, Oh, so heartless or whatever. And they talk about the fact that his father-in-law was a Hamas deputy minister of this or that. All of that kind of makes it okay for an American reader to understand why the Israelis might have killed this person. I mean, it's mind-blowing that in an obituary, this should be permitted, either in the New York Times, which had published his work, or in the BBC, which I think also gave him a platform. And um, I know there's a magazine in London called Prospect, which had uh, published one of his things in their online version, and they took it down. Because I, I mean, I just want to say that this corporate media silencing of Palestinian voices and Palestinian narratives continues. It's something that all of us need to continue to fight against. And we know that Rifat's ruh will be with us as we do that, because he was fearless. I just want to say that my daughter, Leila, who lives in uh, Brooklyn, went down to her local subway station this morning and found a beautiful quote from Rifat um, had been graffitied onto the subway station. In London, they are flying kites for Rifat. I mean, Rifat's ruh is, is with us and will continue. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. And um, thank you for uh, that indictment of Western media. Um, so uh, I forget who's next, but I know I, I already called it out, so. Uh, yeah, that's uh, me, Shema. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the beautiful memories you shared about Rifat. Um, I've known Rifat for over 15 years, um, since 2008. I was only 14 years old back then. Um, I had joined this um, like extracurricular youth educational program, and he was my teacher there. Um, and he was my teacher throughout my most formative years. I, I am who I am today because of uh, Dr. Rifat and he shaped my thinking and, and he taught me how to view this world and, and kind of exercise my critical thinking skills. Um, that program was um, an American program. So a lot of the curriculum was like very American focused. Um, and Rifat taught us to not just ignore it, but to know how to meaningfully engage with it and how to, to think about it critically. He would teach us about Malcolm X and about the Black Liberation Movement in the US. And he would teach us how we can draw comparisons and connections from global struggles like this to the Palestinian struggle and how we can talk about it and talk about how our, our Palestinian cause is absolutely just and that each one of us has the power and the voice to talk about it. Um, and then, I, I mean, I went to university and he was also my teacher there in undergrad and we would study, you know, literature texts like uh, Shakespeare's The uh, Merchant of Venice. And we, I remember performing the uh, monologue of Shylock on, you know, in front of the class and he would encourage us to really engage meaningfully with these texts and really understand and put our position in, in the opposite side and see how we can find the humanity in everyone. But also remember that as Palestinians, we have a very strong voice, we have a loud voice and that we should use it for our Palestinian cause until the liberation of Palestine. 
the last time I've, I've seen Dr. Rifat in person was back in 2015. I had just graduated and I was waiting for um, my tansik, as you mentioned, Helena, because I was supposed to travel to continue my uh, graduate studies. And he had contacted me and, and said, hey, do you want to um, write a, a story and, um, and have it published? We're doing this kind of creative writing uh, course kind of thing. And you want to come? And, and I said, yes. And um, I went to the first class. And um, in that class, I got a call that said, hey, you got the permit. You're leaving in two days. And I remember that they Rafat, like clapped and cheered. And he was so happy. And I remember both him and I were having these conversations back then. And he's like, yeah, a bit safi. I, I pray that you, you're able to travel. And I would say the same thing back to him because his PhD program was interrupted. Um, and he was stuck in Gaza for a while. And he needed to go back to continue and he was there for me every every step of the way um and just last month i've lost my brother in an israeli bombing and two days ago when i heard about the murder of Rifat, i felt like i lost another brother and a friend until now i was still hoping that someone would come out and, and tell us that that's not true it's, it's, He's still alive, he's still okay. And, but I know that at least he's alive in all of us. And that we, every one of us, every one of his students and friends will work really hard to make sure that his memory stays alive and that we carry on with his mission. I do feel like I lost my compass by losing him. He truly was the compass for all of us. But I will work really hard to honor his memory and really carry out the struggle until Palestine is free, inshallah. Thank you. Inshallah, Shayma. Thank you so much. You will continue his journey and teach your children. If I, I don't have a lot to say. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Khalid. <clears throat> I was a student of Dr. Rifat along with Ahmed and Abdullah and Nadia. We were all together. And uh, since I was struck with the news, uh, just like not to be... I don't know. I, I like. I still feel in denial. But I, what I'm doing right now, I'm just collecting a lot of things that were special to Rafat. His sayings, his memes, his his jokes, everything about him. Uh, uh, Rafat literally created generations of students. You can see this through this webinar, and I thank you for this. You just can see people from different positions, from different backgrounds, all were impacted by Rafat's wisdom, uh, by his stories, by everything he's saying. Uh, uh, I remember he just made me a meticulous researcher. I started to work with him before I graduated on a research paper, and I would always collecting their sources. And whenever I bring something without a source, he would just mock me and would say, says who Khalid Dadr, just go on and bring a reliable source. And he would always end the conversation by saying, you have a good knack of research. And I, I don't think I can sum it up better. Just he created uh, the academia in me, created the love of poetry in me, everything in me. And he was so creative to the extent he created his own sayings. And one of them that I just, it's, I, I cannot forget it. And I just pass it on to my friends. Who knows the culture of food and he would always say that to something that's bad he would say this is as bad as uh eating ketchup with shawarma and the, the more he used this it has become a saying that we all know and we pass it on uh i don't know but i i i, I didn't i i can i disconnected with him uh before i left gaza in 2021 but then i connected with him again uh, this year and we started working again on the research paper we were working on it was on gender uh, balance in poetry textbooks and we managed to finish it but we didn't we were accepted to publish it but and also we were were about to meet on the 10th of October that was the the plan and then the war happened and we were connecting we were texting all over the world and then and he was like yeah let's meet after the war and finish it up and publish it but uh, what I know now, uh, regardless of everything, is that I would do whatever I can just to publish this paper. 
with my name next to him and I know everyone has a, has a lot to say but just for time's sake and uh I just I hope he's in a better place uh mm -hmm. I, I I as he always said it like uh, words fail me to ex to express how he ignited everything good in us uh I I don't think I have thank other you. things to say but yeah thank you thank you so much Khaled uh, Abdul Rahim Abdul Rahim Abu Warda thank you so much thank you so much for given us this chance to honor his memory. Um, Rafat to me and to, to my wife, to Iman, wasn't only a friend, he, he was a family and and he loved our kids. Uh, he loved Faisal, Jawad and Rita uh, and, and he even like visited uh, visited us uh, when, when Iman gave birth to, to Rita and he, uh, he was very happy um uh, that we had Rita and he was also very happy that we called her we named her Rita uh like because he he was a he he uh he used to teach us Mahmoud Darwish poetry even uh, like in 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 his English classes I did, I only had a class with him and I was scared of him actually uh it was English language uh uh English introduction to English literature and I was I wasn't that good student. I was a helpless writer to him. And uh, but luckily my wife was Iman was like he, he saw a great potential in, in Iman as a writer and he pushed her like beyond words to 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 be that good writer and he connected her with many uh, uh journalists in the in the UK, in the US, and 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 she managed to publish many, many feature stories thanks to him. I owe him a lot, and he also like uh he pushed me so hard to apply for the Fulbright I I applied for the Fulbright five times and uh I I was always rejected and he was always telling me that uh, I believe in you and I believe that you can do it um and and finally I did it he was like he also like uh wrote me the recommendation letters for the Fulbright and for the universities and then I got to Wyoming and and he was making fun of Wyoming and he was always saying that there's no place called Wyoming. We we even had like a group chat, uh, me, him, uh, Ahmed, uh, Abdullah and uh, Noor and Iman. And, and and the name of the group is Wyoming and Nazla. I'm from uh, a village called Nazla. So he was making fun of, uh, of Wyoming and... He he was actually like uh, worried about me going to Wyoming because Wyoming has always been like a Republican state, and he was afraid that I might be like attacked or something. But uh, luckily, it wasn't the case. Um, Abdul, Abdul Rahim, I don't mean to interrupt you, but really, we are very time uh, tight with time, so I hope you understand. And now we need to go to Muhammad Al Khatib uh, and then. Uh, to uh, Rawan. Thank you, Abdul Rahim. We really appreciate your input. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, um, My name is Muhammad Al Khatib. Uh, so I know my friends uh, uh, have said everything about Dr. Rafat, uh, and they left nothing for me to say, but I, I would like to mention a couple of stories uh, with him and how he influenced my life. <clears throat> so I still remember the first time I met him, he was speaking in English all the time and I couldn't I couldn't understand anything so I went to his office I was crying I still remember and I, I I told him I don't understand anything of what you say and he said hey wipe your tears and he grabbed a paper and a pen and he told me what, what words what words you don't understand and I said that and that and that he wrote them down and said you should google them all right, this is uh, Google them. I, I love this word from his mouth. Google it. Google it. So, uh, yeah, like another thing I, I am like, I'm really proud to be uh, in his friendship zone. And I'm really proud uh, when he used to introduce me to other people and say, Muhammad Al-Khatib, Badrasawi, but we in Shijaiya adopted him. And I, I felt so proud that I'm, I'm, I'm from Shijaiya, from uh, the same city he was from. Um, and the final thing I want to say, um, like Israel, um, 
um, has destroyed my dreams of being uh, from from being uh, Dr. Rafat's student to be uh, to uh, Dr. Rafat's uh, colleague because I'm studying English literature now. And I hope I'm gonna be a second ver version of Dr. Rifat and uh, make his students uh, as they are today and uh, make other Rifats, inshallah. Inshallah, so. inshallah Muhammad. Rawan Yaghi, I think I had you on our uh, radio show, True Talk, once the book was uh, published. I'm sorry that we have to connect uh, in such circumstances, but go ahead, Rawan. Hello, everyone. And, um... And what if that was a loss to all of us? Um, the man who always showed up with a book under his elbow. And the man whose love for storytelling was infectious. The man who kept holding on to his humanity despite all. Um, I just want to mentioned two things I I think of when I think of Rifat. Well, three. One, The first one Ahmad was talking about yesterday. He said, whenever I, whenever there's a chance to talk or write or do something, I, I feel like I don't want to because of the pressure. But I see Rifat standing in the corner and telling me, telling me off, telling me to to suck it basically <laughs> and uh, and do my best. Um, the second is a memory of Rifat that encapsulates him among his students. Um, he, he was teaching one of my stories to his uh, university students and it was a very crowded class, I remember. Very small classroom, very crowded. And he asked me to sit in the back of the class. And after they finished discussing my story, he asked me to walk to the front of the class. And then just watching the students' faces, he said, this is the writer. Um, and he did it because he wanted to see their jaws drop. And he, he wanted to see the shock on their faces. But most importantly, he wanted them to believe that any one of them could write a story like that. Um, and the third is, and I conclude with that, um, a week before he was killed, I asked him what gave him hope recently, despite everything. You know, he was running from place to place. He had a big family to support and find food and water for. And he said, um, his kids, the little ones, and the many students he was going to teach, and the many stories he was going to write. And even though when I think of that, I think of the loss of the many stories that he was going to write, and the many students he was going to teach, I'd like to think that we will carry on his mission to tell their stories as an addition as an indigenous people that lay our claim to the land through our stories and through our narrative that was what he was what he believed in and that's what we will carry on doing thank you thank you so much uh, Rowan. um who's next is it yusuf or yahya ashur Either one, very quickly. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for organizing uh, this webinar to Anna Rifat. Uh, Rifat was my teacher, my friend. Um, we were very close and we traveled um, to Malaysia together, to the United States together. And I have always stayed in touch with him, uh, even though I left Gaza seven years ago. Uh, he was the greatest human being I um, have ever known. Uh, Rawan and I traveled with him uh, in 2014 in the United States, and he was telling people about Gaza and, you know, the power of storytelling. And he had the greatest sense of humor. Uh, 
uh, dark humor sometimes and he would you know accuse us of stealing his lines like palestine is a story away palestine is a stone away um he was gifted in many different ways he's a he was a poet he was a, a writer he was a lecturer uh the same as Rifat was universal in his classroom. Um, his killing was also universal, and everyone is talking about him today. Uh, he was a very humble and kind human being. He would, like many of his students, became his close friends. He would invite them uh, for food and coffee. Um, we would have, you know, classes in the open air. We uh, sometimes, as I said, we we traveled together and. He invited me to stay with him uh, for three weeks when when we traveled to to Malaysia. He found out that I do not have uh, a place to go to um, because our uh, departure from Gaza was uh, unplanned and, and sudden. And I stayed with him for for three weeks, and um, he cared for me. And uh, I want to conclude with this um, funny story. Um, I I wrote on Facebook after uh, I left his place that I finally had dinner. I went to another friend's house and I was treated for a very good uh, dinner. Uh, and uh, Rifat was in, invited to the same place later on. Um, and I, I wrote, I had, you know, now I can say I, I had dinner. And Rifat called me and he was very angry. And, and he told me, you have to apologize for me. Um, and the only way I will forgive you is uh, if you buy a watermelon. And so I had to go and buy a watermelon and come and apologize to him. He was very funny. He was very smart. Uh, we will never believe that Rifat is, is gone. Rifat is no more. Uh, in our hearts, Rifat is immortal. Rifat is an idea and ideas uh, do not die. We will always remember him as uh, a mentor, a teacher, a friend, a kind-hearted uh, person, a father. He was many things to many people. And uh, as he said, if I must die, you must live to uh, tell my story. Uh, let it be a, a tale, let it be a, a hope. And this is, you know, the message and the um, mission we have as his students, as people who, who knew him closely uh, to continue telling uh, Gaza's story. He was the father of storytelling in Gaza, I would say. Um, he was the one who trained an army of young writers and bloggers and connected them with many websites and journalists uh, across uh, the globe. So uh, I'm very humbled that uh, I was and I will continue to continue to be one of his um, friends and, and students. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, his legacy uh, lives on um, for forever. In, in fact, he visited um a friend in, in, uh, in his dream the day after he was killed and he told him that everyone is talking about you on social media and he asked him the most important thing is that my killing brings about change even in his death you know in, in his killing he wanted change and this is what we're going to do uh, for Rifat uh, for, for Ustaz Rifat as we uh, called him for our friend and, and beloved teacher. Thank you very much. Sonia finally joined in. Uh, go ahead, Sonia, for a minute, uh, please. Yes, yes, I won't take more than a minute. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I didn't know Dr. Rafat, but I am so happy to just be here today. I feel like this is Palestine. I am half Egyptian, half Tunisian. Palestine for me is like for all and everyone who who wants to do something and who can only speak. Uh, I am so honored to be today with you, all of you. I am so happy to have felt all this beautiful love and all this, really, I feel this is a small Palestine gathering, all people, all beautiful feelings. Um, I want you to keep on all, all the beautiful students who have talked about this amazing doctor who I unfortunately have never met but who will for sure talk to everyone I know about him. Uh, please continue his legacy. Uh, and inshallah, we will all meet in Gaza. Inshallah, inshallah. My dream in life is to go to Gaza, Gaza one day. And I'm sure we will all meet and we will all celebrate. Inshallah, we thank you for being so courageous and for being really amazing people. Yani, you are really, really brilliant people. And to yani, fakhrna wa azzatna. يا أهل غزة وربي يعينكم ربي معكم ينصركم شكرا 
Al Shukur Sonia, uh, Susan, would you like to uh, say any parting uh, words and comments? I just want to, um, before others leave, um, listening to all of you is really making me feel like we have to uh, create an anthology um, to document these stories um, because I think we we need to have we need to capture um, the light that Rifat brought into the world um, and all the lives that he touched. We don't have enough books um, and enough uh, biographies and anthologies about uh, people like Hassan Kanafani and, um, and, and, and so many other writers before. And, and I think it's important for, for us to do that. So I put my email in the chat. If any of you are interested in contributing to an anthology like that, please just email me. Um, and, and, and we can just start brainstorming about how to make that happen. And I hope um, others will think about other book ideas, other creative projects about Rifat, about his life, whether it's film, whether it's art, um, paintings, stories, short stories, just memories, please document um, in English and in Arabic. Um, Rifat and I used to disagree about, you know, he always thought it was more important to write in English and I and I felt like it was more important to write in Arabic because but I just you know I, I can't write in Arabic very well but uh, so I think we could do it in both languages and so I just want to put that out there um, and I'll turn it over to you now yeah yeah thank you thank you thank you so much Suzanne for doing this and thank you everyone who who joined uh, um, I want to end with a poem uh, from Refat. Uh, if I must die, if I must die, you must live to tell my story, to sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and some strings, make it white with a long tail, so that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad who left in a place and bid no, no one farewell, not even to the flesh, not even to himself. Seize the kite, my kite you made, flying above and thinks for a moment an angel is there bringing back love. If I must die, let it bring hope let it be a tale. Thank you. We have run out of time. Um, and I'm sorry to those of for, for I know everybody has a lot to say and, and people didn't get a chance to speak. Um, we we clearly need to do this more often. Um, Ali Abu Nama was here earlier and he said that there's going to be, um, <clears throat> uh, I think they're dedicating their podcast for the day, right, Yusuf? Um, on Monday to 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 Rifat. So look for there's going to be more of these memorials, and um, and I I put my like I said I put my email in the chat. I am keen to um, uh, to ensure that uh, Rifat's life. Um, well, I mean he he lives through his work and that's already published. But I, I I'm keen to document all the ways that he touched everybody's life. Um, who who came into his orbit. Uh, a lot of the things that you said um, have moved us to tears. And, and in a lot of ways, I feel like my, uh, my heart is going to burst um, with, you know, I sent him a message that, you know, we, the, when we were talking about the zoo, we talked about what we were going to do um, to rebuild Gaza. And we talked about how this is the end of Israel. And now I feel, you know, I know this is this is the beginning of Israel's end and it will end and this injustice will end. I have no doubt about that. And I'm just, um, I feel sorry that Rifat will not be here to celebrate with us, but I think um, when it happens, he will be with us um, in ways that are not physical. 
So um, I'll turn it over to you, Samad, for last words. Um, and thank you, everybody, for, uh, for being here. Thank you, Susan. I think several people uh, wrote uh, in the chat that somebody needs to write the story of uh, Rifat, and I suggested that you do. You're a great storyteller, and you can, I'm sure, weave his life into some wonderful story about him and about Gaza. I want to thank everyone who listened. We had people from all over the world, really, from Australia and from South Africa and from Nigeria and Kenya and Tunisia and Egypt. I can't uh, wrap my head uh, around the number of people who sent messages of love and care. So many people ma biarafu rifat al arir wa ma arfu ghar minna wa ma arfu ghar minkum. So I am really uh, very, very encouraged that his memory will stay alive. And I really do care about his children. He loved them. He loved his daughters. When we spoke with uh, Rifat during, uh, I think, the Gaza war during the Jarrah, uh, Sheikh Jarrah thing, um, he cried because we could hear the bombs and we could hear his daughters being scared. He was a very, very sensitive man. So please uh, continue writing about him so his children know that when they grow up that their dad uh, legacy did not end with his death. Actually, it is just starting. Uh, thank you so much for uh, tuning in and please keep spreading the word about Palestine. Uh, keep talking about Palestine. Thank you, Susan, for um, taking the initiative to do something about Rifat and thank you all. I bid you farewell. Inshallah, uh, nitabal kullayatna fi Palestine al-Muharrara. Thank you.